Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Wednesday night prayer and Bible study time together. I, uh, I want to begin by just telling you how very delighted I was uh, to have seen many of you in church Sunday. Uh, it was great just to have people back in God's house. Um, I don't know the exact number we had. Uh, we, were, we were expecting fewer than we had the first time we started, uh, but we ended up with somewhere around 60 people there. And um, again, I, the number was not important. What was important was that we were back gathering together in the house of the Lord, and it was great uh, to have been there, great to see folks sitting out in the pew. And I think those that were there were just as delighted to be there as I was to see them there. I hope so, and I certainly think that was true. Uh, this Sunday, we'll be back. I know it's a holiday weekend, but uh, we'll be back 11 o'clock. Um, hope to see many of you. And let me let me just say again, because I want, I want to make sure you understand and you, and you hear my heart. Uh, for those of you who still are a little hesitant to come back and, and you're going to wait a little bit longer, uh, hey, please know, in my encouraging folks to be there and in my sharing my delight to see those present, I understand um, that there are some who still, because of health reasons and safety reasons, are going to wait a little longer. And if that's true of you, I um, understand. You come when you feel the Lord wants you to be there. Uh, I hope it'll be sooner than later, but you'll know when it's right, and God will give you the peace of mind and the peace of heart to come. And I'll delight when I see you there just as much as I have these others. So thank you, and uh, we look forward to again this Sunday. Let's start with a time of prayer tonight. First of all, I want us to pray um, for uh, a couple of needs in our own country right now. One, many of you are aware of the hurricane that hit uh, the Louisiana-Texas border this past week. And there are many, many people who are still trying to put their lives back together, some who lost loved ones um, we want to pray for organizations like our own um, disaster relief teams with the North American Mission Board and Red Cross and others who are down there assisting people and trying to help them get their lives back together. Uh, so we want to pray for that. And I also want us to pray as we're seeing in many ways um, the looting and the rioting across our nation, uh, material possessions being destroyed, lives being taken, uh, anarchy uh, in the streets, and it's a, it's a sad day. And we certainly want to pray for these areas. First, that God will bring peace. Uh, those that are guilty of, of doing destroying life and uh, property will be brought to justice and that this will soon stop. What a ridiculous commentary it is on the state of affairs in America right now. So, Let's pray for those things. Again, you might want to pause your uh, video and um, for just a second, and uh, I'll pray, uh, and you pray along with those that there in your in your uh, home or wherever you're watching this uh, presentation tonight. So, Lord, uh, we do give you thanks for this past Sunday. Thank you that we were able to get back uh, at least the first step in, in worshiping together in the physical place called uh, the church, First Baptist Church of Adel. We thank you. Lord, I thank you for every person that was there, and I look forward to seeing others in the days to come. And Lord, for those that are still a little leery and are waiting, give them peace of mind, and Lord, you direct their steps, and, and you let them know when it's time. And Lord, we just trust you to do that, and we just pray that you'll make it safe uh, so that uh, everyone will be able to come back soon. And God, we, we pray for this, this disease, that it will, uh, Lord, be put it still so that we can... We can get on about life. It's disrupted life in so many ways, but Lord, and also in so many ways, it's caused us to look to you in a fresh way. So Lord, we do thank you. And uh, I do pray for these matters. Lord, we pray for those in the Gulf Coast that are still having to deal with the aftermath of Hurricane Laura. And God, we pray for safety. We pray for those who are down there with cleanup crews and offering assistance that you be with them. Guide their steps, protect them all the way. Lord, somehow through all this disaster, use it for your glory and honor. I pray as the witness of folks who are down there ministering from our disaster relief team and other Christian organizations, Lord, give them opportunities to share the good news and the hope that's found in Jesus. And Lord, for those who have lost loved ones and even those who have lost, some of them, in some cases, all their material possessions, 
We pray for your comfort to be upon them. God, give them a peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, through it all, uh, teach them and us too that, Lord, there are more important things than physical things in this world. So, Lord, we look to you and pray for those. And then we pray, Lord, concerning the, the looting and the rioting in our nation. God, what an absolute shame and what, what, what a travesty it is to see this happening. We pray for peace. God, actually, we pray for a mighty move of God that would stop this foolishness and bring people to our knees and make us turn once again to you. Lord, for those who are behind it, we pray that you will stop it. Lord, I, I, I wouldn't dare begin to tell you how, uh, how to do that, but God, you're, you're in charge and you know who it is. And we just pray that you would put a stop to it. Uh, Lord, we pray you'd keep the evil one from having his way here in our land. And Lord, even during this, what I would say is a disaster time in our nation, God, would you use it to call us back to you so that we might turn our attention once again to the God that has so blessed this land that we call America. So Lord, we pray for our country, we lift it to you, and we pray for, again, those that are going through difficult, dark times right now in our land, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Secondly tonight, let me ask you uh, to once again pray for those in the community that you know of that have special needs. Uh, maybe those who have uh, sick, maybe some who have lost loved ones, financial needs, spiritual, certainly those with spiritual needs, those who need salvation. And uh, let's just pray. Uh, if you've gotten your prayer list uh, from the church for this week, if not the one from last week, uh, just lift those needs to the Lord so again, you might wanna pause, do that for a second. Uh, I'm gonna just be quiet for a moment, give you a chance to do that, and then I'll close that prayer time, and then we're gonna pray for one other matter, and then we'll look into our study tonight on um, prayer. So let's pray. And Lord, even as uh, many have stopped the video right now or pausing for a time of prayer, we do pray for the needs of those in, in uh, our church community and in the Adel community. God, those who uh, have spiritual needs, who need to be saved, God, we pray uh, for your work in their heart and life, your drawing, uh, give them enlightenment, bring somebody across their path that will, uh, Lord, share the good news of the gospel with them. Lord, I pray for those who have physical needs. Lord, some are still recovering from COVID, others with, with other needs. Um, God, we just lift them to you. Thank you that you're Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals us. God, those who have financial needs right now, for some, Lord, it's tough right now because of, of um, um, without work. And, and Lord, we just lift them to you. Lord, for all the needs that have been listed on our prayer sheet and for others that are unspoken, others that maybe don't have freedom to be able to share the need, but something is a deep burden in their heart and in their life, you know that need. And God, we're grateful tonight that you're a God who meets our needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. And I just pray that you would do so and that you'd work and answer in such a way that you'll be honored and glorified. And Lord, for these things, we're gonna be careful to give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name, amen. And then lastly, let's lift the church up one more time. Uh, well, I'll say one more time. We'll obviously do that more than one more time, but let's do it again. And the two main needs are two main things I want us to pray. Number one, I want us to continue to pray for the search team as they're uh, working diligently and seeking God's face and talking to folks and um, seeking God's will and um, bringing a candidate to the church. Let's pray for them and lift them up. And then secondly, I mentioned to you Sunday, uh, just encourage you in your giving because uh, a lot of times when folks are not present, sometimes their giving um, can be a little slack. And folks, you know, you, you've been very faithful. Many of you have been very faithful all along the way. Uh, the first couple of months, giving was solid and, and came in good. And uh, these last uh, few months, they've been dragging some, but please know uh, there's still expenses that have to be paid at the church. Boy, y'all wanna be in a good position when you get your pastor that he, you'll be able to meet his needs as he comes in and position the church so that you can call staff and others uh, that are gonna to need to be there. 
So let me I say all that just to, to encourage you in your giving. And, and I would remind you, um, above all else, that we need to be faithful in our giving to the Lord's work regardless. Um, uh, it's, it's a command of scripture, and we know that's mandated from the Lord to each of us. So just an encouragement. And uh, if you need to get caught up, please do so. Continue to be faithful. Uh, thank you to those who, of you who are. So Lord, these two needs, we do pray for the financial uh, needs of the church. God, move it on the hearts of your people. And uh, Lord, where you got us, you always provide and you often use your people to provide the resources that are needed. So God, I pray that we'll give out of a spirit of, of, uh, of blessing, that we'll give out of a spirit of obedience. And Lord, you will meet the every need of our church in such a special way. You have done that. Lord, that's been your record uh, forever. And, uh, we have no doubt you will continue to do that, but, uh, Lord, we pray for that need. And, and then for the search team, as they continue their process, these next few months or these next few weeks and, and possibly months, God, that you would guide their steps, give them clarity, open doors. No man can shut and shut doors. No man can open. And we're going to thank you. Look with excitement at uh, what you're going to do in the life of First Baptist Church of Adel in the days to come. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this next Sunday, we'll be in our fourth study out of the book of uh, James. We'll be looking at the topic of temptation Sunday and how we need the wisdom of God uh, to deal with temptation and how God uses temptation to mature us and to grow us up in himself. Now, tonight... A few weeks ago, uh, we started a series on Wednesday nights entitled Pray, and it's simply a, a series um, that I, I'm, I'm sharing with you to encourage you both personally and corporately as a church to be involved in the ministry of prayer. Jesus said that his church was to be known as a house of prayer, and uh, how the church and First Baptist Adel included how we need to get back to that very important but often overlooked and misplaced ministry of the church, the ministry of prayer. So for the last couple of weeks, we've asked the question, what is prayer? And I answered it over the last two weeks. I'm not gonna stay long with it, but I said prayer is, in week one, prayer is conversation, it's talking and listening to God. It's critical, and it's critical to our walk, our spiritual well-being. It is uh, communion, in other words, it's an invitation to fellowship with God. Uh, fourthly, prayer is character, it's our response to the very character of God. Fifthly, prayer is commitment. It's our committing to the will of God, and we do that through prayer. And then I shared with you that prayer is connecting. It's where we connect with the power and the provision of God. And then last week, we extended that definition of what is prayer by saying prayer is worship. Uh, prayer is an act of worship. It is an extreme act of worship. Secondly, prayer is work. In fact, in many ways, it's the greater work that Jesus spoke of in the scriptures. And then thirdly, I shared with you, prayer is warfare. The war is fought and won in the spiritual realms on our knees. And that's why Paul wrote all that he did in Ephesians 6 about putting on the full armor of God. So for tonight, uh, I wanna begin by sharing uh, some thoughts and truths with you about prayer that I trust the Lord will use to challenge you and, and challenge me also to be faithful in our prayer lives and challenge us to deepen our prayer lives in him, whatever your level of prayer, praying might be. Uh, first of all, before I do that, uh, and speaking of prayer, did you hear the story about the little boy by the name of Gary and his prayer? And the story goes that during the pastor's prayer at church one Sunday morning, uh, there was a loud whistle uh, from the congregation. It was Gary. And Gary's mother was horrified to realize that this loud whistle during the pastor's prayer was coming from her son. So she grabbed him up and uh, quickly escorted him out of uh, the church, obviously very upset and with a very angry tone in her voice. She looked Gary straight in the eyes and she said to him, son, what in the world made you do that? To which Gary answered honestly, and he answered seriously, well, mama, I've been asking God to teach me to whistle, and he all of a sudden answered my prayer. 
Well, God does answer our prayers. And um, tonight we're gonna talk about prayer in a little bit deeper manner. And I hope again that it might encourage you to deepen your prayer life with the Lord. I mentioned, uh, I believe I've mentioned it in both weeks, a prayer book, a book on prayer that has meant a lot to me, written by author Jack Taylor. It is a book entitled uh, Prayer Life's Limitless Reach. And again, if you've never read that book, I would I would encourage you to uh, get a copy and read it. It's a fascinating book on prayer and a very encouraging book on prayer. And the very beginning of the um, book, uh, Dr. Taylor lays out some statements about prayer. Actually, he lists seven, I believe, that he says are motivating principles concerning prayer. And these so spoke to my heart so many years ago. I've used these as a reminder to both myself and to churches that I've had the privilege of serving uh, to, to, to encourage us in the priority of prayer in our own personal lives and in the life of the church. I, I wanna give you four of those seven statements as I begin tonight, and I probably will refer to them a number of times over these next couple of weeks. But I want you to listen very, very carefully. Four motivating statements concerning prayer. Number one, no believer's spiritual life will rise to stay above the level of his or her praying. Number two, no church's ultimate effectiveness will rise to stay above the level of its corporate prayer life. Number three, no church's corporate prayer life will be greater than the personal prayer lives of those who make up its membership. And number four, no believer's prayer life will rise to stay above the level of his or her personal, regular, daily time of worship and being alone with God. Now those are pretty strong statements, aren't they? But folks, they are absolutely true. And I hope you'll ponder them a little bit. I hope you'll think about them again. In fact, they're so important. Let me, let me read them to you again to make sure you get it. Statement number one, no believer's spiritual life will rise to stay above the level of his or her praying. Now evaluate your life in light of that statement. I evaluate my life in light of it. Statement number two, no church's ultimate effectiveness will rise to stay above the level of its corporate prayer life. And maybe that explains a lot about why the church is in the mess it is in many cases today. Statement number three, no church's corporate prayer life will be greater than the personal prayer lives of those that make up its membership, and that's absolutely true. And statement number four, no believer's prayer life will rise to stay above the level of his or her regular, personal, daily time alone with God in worship and prayer. Uh, so it's my deep desire during uh, this series of messages, we all, uh, both individually and corporately as a church, will be motivated to a new level of prayer and that we will once again see how absolutely vital prayer is both to our own walk with the Lord and our churches. So we're gonna talk about, and I'm gonna be sharing with you in the days to come, how um, you can seek to raise the level of your prayer life and your prayer commitment uh, to the Lord. Well, for the last couple of weeks, we did consider the question, what is prayer? Tonight, I want to consider two more questions about prayer and quickly answer these. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now that I'm going to kind of uh, rapid fire the answers to these. And you, maybe you'll need to go back and listen if you want to jot some of these things down. But I want to answer, ask first of all tonight, how important is prayer? How important is prayer? And then we'll look at one more question before we close our study for tonight. So let me ask and answer the question, how important is prayer? And here are a few answers that I would offer uh, to that question. Number one, you can see the importance of prayer in the life of the early church. And as you, as you walk through the New Testament, you see it was absolutely vital in the life of the early church. Acts 1.4 says these all which were the early believers there in Jerusalem with one mind 
were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brothers. They were continually devoting themselves to pray. Acts 1.24, and they, the early church, prayed. Acts 2.42, they, the early church, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the Bible says to prayer. Acts 3.1, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. Now what were they doing going up to the temple in the hour of prayer? Well, it's obvious. They were going up to pray. It was that important uh, to them. Uh, Acts 4, verse 31, and when they, again, the early church, had prayed, the place where they had gathered were shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So we could, we could go on in the book of Acts and we could look at other places as Paul wrote and Peter wrote and James wrote and you see the absolute importance of prayer and the priority of prayer in the early church. Uh, that is why we should, uh, why, uh, how important is prayer? And that's the first answer to that question. Second answer, you can see the importance of prayer through the history of the Christian church. And as you read through the history beginning there in Jerusalem, even to present day, uh, you will see that prayer was important and was a vital part of the life of the ministry of every church that has been in existence in every generation of the church. If anything was accomplished for the kingdom of God, it found its roots in the ministry of prayer. Thirdly, you can see the importance of prayer in revivals over the years, particularly the last couple or three centuries as revivals to the life of the church. 
But I have to tell you, we can find no greater example of the importance of prayer in the life of the church and in the life of the Christian than that that was found in the life and through the life of the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus came to model for us the perfect man. Jesus showed us by his perfect life what's important and what's not important. He set an example for us to follow. And I want you just to think for a moment about how very vital prayer was in the life of the Lord Jesus himself. Let, let, me, just, let me just walk you down some of those things. Uh, before Jesus started his earthly ministry, he prayed and he fasted for 40 days. Matthew 4, verses 1 and 2. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Prayer and fasting always went together. That was the purpose of fasting, to better enable you to seek God in the spiritual realm by doing it without the physical so Jesus began his earthly ministry with 40 days and 40 nights of prayer and fasting. Before he picked his 12 disciples, he spent a whole night in prayer. Luke 6, verses 12 to 13, it was about this time that Jesus went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent a whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, and he called his disciples as apostles. We know that Jesus took time to teach his disciples how to pray. It was one of the things as the master, he taught his disciples. Luke 6, verses 9 to 13. And as he's speaking to not only his 12, but to the, the masses that had gathered around him there at the uh, Mount of the Beatitudes, Jesus said, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Pray then, Jesus said to his followers in this way he taught them to pray. Uh, prayer was important to Jesus he, uh, because he would get up early in the morning to pray. In fact, in Mark verse, uh, verse 35 of the first chapter, we find that Jesus had been ministering all day and all night in the city of Capernaum. And while it was still early, this is what it says, in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went away to a secluded place, and was praying there. And that seemed to be the regular practice of the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, before he fed the multitude, he prayed. John 6, 11, Jesus took the loaves and gave them thanks. And what's, what's that? It's prayer. He distributed to those who were gathered. But before he raised Lazarus from the dead, what did Jesus do? He prayed. Uh, John 11, verses 41 to 43. So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and said, listen to this prayer. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know you've always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The Lazarus came forth from the grave. Uh, prayer was important to the life of Jesus. Uh, we see it in John 17, which is really the Lord's prayer. And there we have recorded for us the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples, both then and now. I, I won't read that whole prayer to you, but let me just read three verses from that 17th chapter of John. Verse 1, verse 9, verse 20. Jesus spoke these things, lifting up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Verse 9, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word. Hey, in a real way, Jesus is not only praying for his disciples back in the first century. He's prayed for you today in this 21st century. Hey, before Jesus went to the crucifixion, what did he do? Before he went to the cross, what did he do? He prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, didn't he? Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus said to them, or came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he did. 
And then even on the cross, Jesus prayed. Luke 23, verses 33 and 34. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right, one on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. He prayed for you on the cross. He prayed for me. He prayed for those that had crucified him. And think about this just for a moment. Let me ask you something. What is the Lord Jesus doing right now? What is his activity in heaven? What is he doing as he waits for his return to this earth? Well, I'm going to tell you what he's doing. He's praying for you, and he's praying for me. In Hebrews 7, chapter, verse 25, the, the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore he, speaking of Jesus, is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is praying for you. Prayer was very important in the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. In fact, Billy Graham once said of the prayer life of Christ the following, Jesus had only three years of public ministry, but he was never too hurried to spend hours in prayer. No day began or closed in which he was not in communion with the Father. To the Son of God, uh, prayer was the most important, was more important than assembling great crowds. He often withdrew into the wilderness in prayer and prayed. And if Jesus felt that he had to pray, how much more do we need to pray? Well, that's why prayer is important, folks. And I just be honest with you, you'll never grow in your own Christian life without an active prayer life, and the church will never be more powerful or as powerful as God wants it to be without the church being involved in an active prayer life. That's why I said what I did and shared with you those four statements at the very beginning of our study tonight. Well, let me take the last few minutes that I've got for this evening. Let me ask and answer this question. Why should we pray? And some of this I'm just going to give to you quickly. Some of this you know it's very obvious, but I think it's just a reminder to us. Why should we pray? Number one, we should pray. If for no other reason is to follow Christ's example, I just shared with you how important it was for Jesus to pray. And folks, let me tell you, if Jesus needs to pray, I guarantee you, you need to pray, and I know I need to pray. So we do it to follow. There are at least 22 different examples of praying found in the gospel accounts of the Lord Jesus. 22 different times in the books that we have about Jesus that it tells us about him being involved in the ministry of prayer during his life here on this earth. And again, if it was important enough for Jesus, it's important enough to, uh, for us. So we should pray to follow Christ's example. Secondly, we should pray in order to glorify God. Uh, John's Gospel, the 14th chapter, verse 13 says, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You know, the greatest goal of any child of God should be the glory of God. In fact, the great old West, Westminster um, Catechism asked the question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer to that question is simply this. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And here in this verse, we are told that we are to pray. Jesus answered, and when we do that, the Father is glorified. So God is ultimately glorified as we pray, and he answers our prayers to his own glory. So folks, we should pray to follow Christ's example. We should pray to glorify and honor God. God is glorified when we pray. Thirdly, tonight, we should pray to obey God's command. All through the Bible, we we're commanded to pray, not suggested. We we're commanded to pray. And not to pray is to disobey the commandments of the Lord. Colossians 4, 2, Paul writes, and he says, Be devoted to prayer. That word devote means to give yourself entirely to something. Be devoted to prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. We'll talk about that verse a little bit later on. Pray without ceasing. Ephesians 6, 18, Paul said, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. So we are to pray, we must pray in order to obey Scripture. Fourthly, we should pray 
in order to have fellowship with God. And I've already shared that with you about prayer and fellowship. But listen to a couple of additional verses that connects prayer and fellowship uh, together. Proverbs 15, 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. Listen to that again. The prayer of the upright, that godly man or godly woman, is God's delight. He delights in your prayers. Uh, Jeremiah 29, verses 12, the first part of verse 14, and then you will call upon me and come and pray me, and I'll listen to you, and you'll seek me, and find me when you search me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, or I will I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I get my little tongue tied there. The, the point is simple that I'm making. It, it is through prayer that we're able to find God. It's through God, prayer that we're able to fellowship with God. It's, it's through prayer we're able to delight the heart of God. All of those things speak of our fellowshipping and walking with God, and it's prayer that enables us uh, to be able to do that. Fifthly, we should pray to receive. Now, prayer should be much more than just us asking God to receive things. But the bottom line is this, folks. In order to receive anything from God, we must first ask. John 14, verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Uh, James 4, first part of, uh, last part of verse 2. We'll talk about this verse a little later in our study in James. James dealing with... Uh, reasons they were not having their prayers answered and he said you do not have because you do not ask so in, in the Christian economy of things we receive as we ask and we ask through prayer sixthly we should pray to acquire spiritual guidance I, I read some verses out of Jeremiah 29 minutes ago let me read a couple more I'll read verses 11 through 14 to get the full context there and this is what it says, Jeremiah 29, 11 and 14. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Hey, it's through prayer that we're able to seek God for spiritual guidance in life. It's, it's, it's through prayer we're able to discern and understand the will of God for our lives. It's through prayer that God guides us along life's journey. It's through prayer that I'm able to express my need for God's guidance and to seek God for guidance. And it's through prayer that God's able to give me such. How important prayer is, and I know in my own life, there have been often times that I've had major decisions, and sometimes there have been minor decisions in life, but I just needed God's wisdom. I needed God's direction, and how did I get it? James answered that before. We saw that a week before last. You ask, you, you get it when you ask by faith. So we pray in order to acquire our spiritual guidance and wisdom. Seventhly, we should pray to receive healing. Did you know that? Hey, I don't know about you, but I believe God's still in the healing business. He is Jehovah Rapha, or Rapha, as some people would say. He is the God who heals us. And how do we receive God's healing? Well, James, again, tells us how. I'll read verses 14, 15, 16, the fifth chapter. If any among you sick, that he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And then that verse that we, we quote so often, the context is praying for healing, but then he says the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So we need to pray to receive healing. Eighthly, uh, we should pray uh, for Christ-like love. We should pray for Christ-like love. And this is why I say that, folks. What is the supreme mark or characteristic or attribute of a Christian? Or what should it be? And the Bible is absolutely clear on that. You shall know them by their love. Their love. And, and, and in other words, the greatest 
outward attribute and characteristic of a believer in Jesus ought to be their love, their love for God, their love for their fellow man, their love for their neighbor. Jesus spoke of that often. But the problem is this, in our natural abilities and our natural power, we don't, we don't have that kind of love. Now, some people are more loving than others. We all know that. And probably in all of our lives, there are times that we're, we're more loving and we are more lovable than others. But folks, I'm to love everyone, even my enemies, even those that persecute me, even those that speak evil against me, even those that do me wrong, those that rub me the wrong way. And we've all got those kind of people in my life. And the scriptures tell me I'm to love them. How do I do that? I don't have the strength to do it. You don't have the strength to do that. I'm only able to demonstrate that kind of love through Christ. I have to love them with the love of the Lord. I have to let him love them through me. And how do I seek for such love as that? I have to ask God for it. I have to seek him. And I have to ask him for that kind of love. I don't have it within me. You don't either. So I have to ask the Lord for it. And when I ask, he gives. Philippians 1, 9 and 10. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in the real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will abound. Oh, Lord, I need your love to abound in me and through me. For all people. And then I would say lastly tonight, and maybe not more importantly, but this may be one of the more simple answers to that question. Why should we pray? Uh, we should pray in order to grow spiritually. No man, no woman will rise to stay spiritually above the level of his or her prayer life. None of us will be the man of God or the woman of God that we must be if we do not have prayer as an active part of our lives. And folks, again, I hope you'll hear this during this study. I hope you'll see that prayer is more than just asking God for me, myself, and I. It, it's, it does include that, yes, there, there's always a the place to ask. But prayer is fellowship with God. It's communion with God. It's asking God to speak to our hearts, to guide us step by step, to give us understanding, to give us discernment, to build in us love. It's it's, it's, it's communicating and fellowshipping with God. It's so much more than just bringing God a glorified shopping list of all my wants. I have to have it to grow. Prayer is to my spiritual life what air is to my physical life. And without it, we wither up and we die. No believer's spiritual life will rise to stay above the level of his or her pray. That's why we ought to pray. And I hope those things challenge you tonight. All right, let me close tonight. Let me close with three quotes uh, that I'll read to you. I hope you'll listen carefully and may God speak to your hearts through these simple statements. Number one, Leonard Ravenhill. One might estimate the weight of the world. Tell the size of the celestial city. Count the stars of heaven, measure the speed of lightning, and tell the time of the rising and of the setting of the sun. But you cannot estimate the power of prayer. Power, prayer is as vast as God because he has committed himself to answer it. Now let me read that part again. Prayer is as vast as God because he has committed himself to answer it. Second statement. A gentleman by the name of Watchman Nee. God's people must pray before God himself will rise up and work. This is a principle for God's working. Since the time of the founding of the church, there is nothing God does on earth without the prayers of his children. And then last night, the great R.A. Torrey, many years ago, said this. Prayer is the key that unlocks all God's storehouses. Or, let, me, let me read that again. Prayer is the key that unlocks all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. All that God is 
and all that God has is at the disposal of prayer. So, Lord, help us to be encouraged tonight. Help us to be challenged by these statements and what we've seen tonight. Thank you for the example of prayer, Lord Jesus, that you set before us. Help us to become men of prayer, women of prayer, churches of prayer. For your glory and honor, we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in tonight again. I uh, look forward to seeing you Sunday at 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll look forward to gathering and worshiping together as the people of God at First Baptist Church of Adel. Thanks. Have a great week. God bless you.